This morning, I'm preaching a sermon series that we have titled Through His Eyes. Uh, two weeks ago, we, we started this series with a message that we titled See Yourself. Amen? And it was about how when you learn to see yourself, how God sees you, it will change the way that you live your life. And then last week, Pastor Dami talked about seeing others as God sees them. Today, I want to talk about having the right perspective on our relationships by seeing them how God sees them. But before I do that, let me tell us a couple of things about relationships. Number one, God created us to be in relationships. Christianity is about relationship. I know that many think Christianity is about a, a building or an organization. But Christianity is about relationship. The Bible says it is because of the love that you show to one another that people will call you my disciples. Really, we are called Christians because we have relationships. And the first step in any relationship is some kind of introduction. Amen? So this morning, to start off a new relationship, I want you to introduce yourself to somebody sitting not far from you. Amen? Go on, introduce yourself to somebody, tell them your name, and ask them for their name. You know what? You can actually get up. You can actually get up and, and, and say hello to somebody you don't know. Introduce yourself to somebody you haven't seen in a while. Welcome somebody into the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. The reason why we should come to church and introduce ourselves to people is because that is what church is about. It is about relationships. It is about connection. It is about people. It is about community. In the book of Genesis, the second chapter and the 18th verse, in the first part of that verse, it says, it is not good for man to be alone. I know that when we read the rest of that verse, it talks about marriage. But it is not good for man to be alone. God did not make you to be an island. God did not intend for you to walk the journey of life alone. He created us for connection. There is a part of you that needs to connect with other human beings. Amen? And in order for us to, to maximize the potential in our lives, to live our lives to the fullest, we need to be in meaningful relationships. Now, I know that nobody, well, I hope that nobody here wants to live life alone. But the truth is many of us are living like that. We look like we have it all together. We've got money, we've got status, we've got property, we've got stuff, but we are alone. We have a bunch of people that hang around with us, but the relationships are so super superficial. And, and, and because we are alone, we suffer alone, we carry our burdens alone, we keep it superficial because superficial is safe. But that was never God's intention. So number one, God intended for you to be in a relationship, for you to be in relationships. Amen? Amen. The second thing is that those relationships are rarely perfect. Why? Because there are no perfect people. If you look at Jesus, Jesus Christ was perfect. Amen? But he dealt with people who were not perfect. And because he dealt with people who were not perfect, he had imperfect relationships. If you look at his biological fam family, the Bible tells us in, the, in John, the second chapter from verse 41 to verse 50, the Bible tells us that when he was 12 years old, think about that for a minute. When he was 12 years old, his parents lost him for three days. In fact, the Bible says they had actually gone a whole day before they realized that their 12-year-old son was not with them. Let me ask you, what kind of communication did they have in that kind of family? That you, your child would disappear for a whole day and you would not know. And it would take you another three days to find him. Remember Jesus at the wedding in Cana of Galilee. The Bible tells us in John chapter 2, verses 3 to 4, that they, they, they went to a wedding and they ran out of wine at the wedding. And Jesus Christ's mother goes up to Jesus because, you know, she's concerned. She doesn't want the folks 
who have organized this wedding to be embarrassed. So he, she goes up to her son, the miracle worker, yeah, and says to him, son, <coughs> let's, let's help these folks out. Let's, you, know, you know that thing that you do of, of, of miracles? Let's help these folks out. Can you turn some water into wine? You know what Jesus Christ said in verse 4? He said, woman. He called his mother. He said, woman. He said, woman, what have I to do with you? My hour is not yet come. Can't you see? Is your eye, is something, can't you see that my hour has not yet come? Now, I, I don't know that she understood. Because, you know, I don't understand Jewish mothers. But if my Nigerian mother <laughs> had asked me to do something for her, she really wasn't asking me. She's telling me, amen, and if I gave her that kind of answer, I mean, my brother is here. Can you imagine calling mommy woman? Yeah. You'd be dead before you could say wine. But you know what? Eventually, he turns the water into wine. But I can bet you $1,000 she gave him the stink eye. There is no way he didn't hear about it when they got home. What's the point I'm trying to make? Relationships are not perfect. They are messy. They are complex. And sometimes they are difficult. But difficulty is not an excuse to walk alone or to keep our relationships superficial. Like I said in the first service, sometimes you have a cold and you're congested and your nose is stuffy and breathing is difficult. If somebody said to you, because it is so difficult to breathe, maybe you should stop breathing. <laughs> what would you say to that person? God punish you. <laughs> Hallelujah. So my goal today is to, is to help us take these superficial relationships or these non-existent relationships from superficial to deep, godly connections. Amen? If you study the life of Jesus, there's a lot to learn from his relationships, and that's whom we should learn from, Jesus. He should be our primary source of wisdom in how we conduct our relationships. Not Oprah, God bless her, or Ellen, or Dr. Phil, and definitely not Steve Harvey. <laughs> Please, I'm not saying we can't learn from them. Meekness is that you have a teachable spirit. You can learn from anybody, amen? But Jesus should be our primary and foundational source of wisdom. Whatever it is they say, no matter how much it tickles our flesh, no matter how much it panders to our pride and our selfishness or our egos, we have to compare it to what Jesus said. Their success does not give them the right to be our primary source of wisdom. Until you die for me, Jesus comes first. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. So let's look at how some of the encounters Jesus Christ had in his relationships. Amen? And maybe we can learn some lessons from that. Number one, Jesus Christ served his friends. He served everybody without recognition, without a desire for appreciation or recognition. If you want deeper relationships, my brothers and sisters, you have to serve. The Bible says in the book of Acts, chapter 20, verse 35, it is more blessed to give than receive. One of the hallmarks of people who are alone is they are selfish. They are very preoccupied with themselves. They don't want to do anything for anybody. And if you see them serving, it is because there's an expectation that they will get. They don't waste their time. They assess you. What can you add to me? If you cannot add anything to me, they keep it moving. That is not Christ-like. And that is not of God. I know we all agree, the Bible says it is, it is, it is easier, it is, it is more blessed to give than to receive. But the truth is, it is easier to receive than to give. It is easier to, to be served than to serve. And, you know, those of us who, these days, we live in America, I know that we're very comfortable with organizations like Habitat for Humanity. We will run, do a marathon to, to aid cancer research. But what betide our friend or neighbor who asks us to come and help them move. 
You will build a house for somebody you don't know. But let somebody who said hi to you say, please, I'm moving. Can you just help me carry a box? Since when? In Africa, we say, I'm an African, in case you can't tell from my accent. I've been working on it. In Africa, we say charity begins at home. But we would rather be charitable to strangers, and that's okay. But the reason why we're charitable is not because we're trying to be friends. It's because we're trying to massage our conscience. And we're still alone. Let's read John chapter 13. I'll read from verse 1, and I'll read verse 4, verse 5, and verse 15. In verse 1, Jesus Christ said, the Bible says, Jesus knew that his, his hour had come to leave the world and return to his father. He now showed the disciples the full extent of his love. He showed them, he demonstrated to them the full extent of his love. So he got up from the table, he took off his robe, he wrapped a towel around his waist, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel he had around him. Then in verse 15, he said, I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. You know, in those days, people walked everywhere. Only wealthy people had horses or chariots. I know we, we watch the movies and everybody's riding on a horse or a donkey. No, people walked, amen? And the roads, again, they didn't have tarred roads. They didn't have concrete sidewalks. So the roads were dirty. They were full of dirt. And when I say dirt, please don't misunderstand. I'm not just talking about sand. Because remember that they didn't have toilets. Yeah, they didn't have sewage systems. What people did was that they pooped in buckets and they chucked it in the streets. Their horses, the donkeys, the cows, everybody pooped on the street. So if you're walking on the street, your feet is not just dust. It is dust plus poop. Horse poop. You get the picture. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. You know, when we think, when we read those scriptures, we're thinking of people wearing, you know, wearing, wearing tennis shoes with socks. Or, or we're thinking of, you know, of people in their loafers, their, their Ferragamos and Louboutins. And, you know, and they just sat down at the table and took off their, their, their sneakers and took off the socks. Maybe their feet were a little cheesy, you know. No. They stank, and it wasn't stink from cheese. It was stink from poop. Amen? You get it? You want me to talk a bit more about it? So you get the picture. So it was necessary. Touch him and say necessary. It was necessary to have your feet washed before they could even serve the food. Amen? And in those days, what they did was because it was such a, a despicable task, such a, a vile thing to do. They had slaves and servants wash the feet of the guest. Amen? So when Jesus Christ got up, the most honored person at the table took off his clothes and put on a, a, a towel, took, up, took a towel, poured water in a basin and started to wash their feet. I want you to understand what was going on here. He wasn't washing Ferragamo clad feet. Amen? The people were shocked. But that is what service is. He didn't think about his position before he got down to help the people. Serving is putting the needs of other people first, even when their feet stink. Service is a sacrifice. It will cost you. But healthy relationships, healthy relationships are built and strengthened, not by wishing it or hoping it, but by Acts of service. And I know some of us here are thinking, if I do all this serving, washing all these stinky feet, this same person, when it is my turn, there will be nowhere to be found. What if I serve and they don't serve me back? Then I become a doormat. And then they take advantage of me. So what we do is we start. We start being nice. But then the person starts to treat us like we are their servant. So we stop. Say, no, 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 respect yourself. 
Amen? That may feel like the right thing to do. And when you tell people about it, they nod their head in understanding and in agreement. But is that the model that Jesus Christ laid down for us? He kept serving all the way to the cross. Remember that Judas Iscariot was sitting on that table. And Jesus knew that this guy with his stinky feet was going to kill him. He said, please, please, let me wash these people who love me. You, move your feet. He kept serving all the way to the cross. And, and, what, and it was at that cross that he found glory. Because he, he served all the way to the cross, the Bible says right now he's seated at the right hand of God. The people whose feet he washed never got a chance to wash his own feet back. For that did not deter him. And what did he get for it? Rejection. Listen, you are never more like God than when you give. That is when you are closest to being like God. Not when you pray. Not when you pray in tongues. But when you give of yourself. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave. You can't give, you'll be alone. You see, Jesus Christ served with empathy and compassion. You see, he didn't just love people or give to people when they were happy, when they did not need anything from him, when they had it all together. You know, we have this expression, we say somebody is needy. Anybody ever heard that? If they call you needy, it's like, please... You have too much baggage. You want too much. So we avoid needy people. Why? Because they want to keep taking from us. You know, I was telling them in the first service, those things we put on Facebook, really, you need to stop. All those, if you are not, on my, if you are not going to help me get to my destination, please get out of the way because I'm going for the goal. <laughs> if you are not going to lift me up, please move out of the way because I'm going for the top. If you can't help me, please leave me. If you can't do anything for me, go away. You know, we, we, we only want people who can bless us around us. We don't want people who need anything from us. We don't want people who will ask us for money. You know, in, in my country, the fastest way to get help is to give the person the impression you don't need it. If people think you are broke, they will not give you work. They only want people around them who won't ask them for anything. So we, we want to surround ourselves with people who have the similar incomes. We don't want to hang out with the low-life people because the low-life people, one day, will come and ask you for a loan. And we don't want that. We don't, we don't, it's not done. We don't want to embarrass ourselves with poor people. So we surround ourselves with wealthy people. We don't want to ever have to stay on the phone for two hours listening to our best friend cry. So we only surround ourselves with emotionally stable people, people who are not needy, who can handle their problems by themselves. That's not Christ-like. Remember, it is, more, it is better to give than to receive. So if you are surrounded with people who never ask you for anything, you're very poor. You're very poor. Jesus Christ knew how to connect even when a person was needy. You know, one of the most famous passages in the Bible, John eleven thirty five, 35, Jesus wept. Why did he weep? Lazarus had died. He saw his sisters, Lazarus' sisters. They were sad that their brother had died. That's what happened when people lose people. They're sad. And the Bible says Jesus wept. He was surrounded by sadness and he wept. He saw the pain in other people, and he wept. He didn't say, my friend, why am I here? I came to wake Lazarus from the dead. What are you crying for? Please, 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 buck up. He wept. He did not allow his strength to keep him from connecting with their weakness. Your wealth should not be a barrier to connecting with somebody who is not rich. Your stability should not be a hindrance to being a blessing to somebody who is emotionally unstable. The Bible says comfort others with the comfort with which you have been comforted. We want to take the comfort. 
put it in a box, and every day just thank God for it. And we feel good because we actually bother to thank God for it. We enjoy it. We drive around in our fancy cars and we feel righteous because we say we do thanksgiving. When it's time for thanksgiving offering, we give. That is not Christ-like. Number three, look at the relationship that Jesus Christ had with Peter. Peter was unbelievably impulsive. In fact, he was so impulsive, they named him Simon. Simon means reed, unstable. He goes wherever it is the wind blows. But as unstable and as impulsive as he was, Jesus was close to him. In Mark 8 and verse 33, Jesus Christ is on his way to die. And he's telling the disciples, guys, I'm about to go die. You know what Peter does? Peter says, please, I reject that for you. <laughs> Don't talk like that. And look at how Jesus responds. He says, get away from me, Satan. Get thee behind me, Satan. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view and not from God's. You see, in that moment, Jesus Christ knew that a critical component of any relationship is telling the truth. Truth is necessary for a relationship to prosper. I can't be friends with you if I cannot tell you the truth. And the truth can sting. But truth is important. The Bible says faithful are the wounds of a friend. Amen? You see, when we hold back the truth from our friends, we're really holding back love. You know, it would have been so easy for Jesus to remain silent. You know where I come from in, in Nigeria? We say, it is not from my mouth that you will hear that the teacher's mother has died. <laughs> Lest the teacher be angry and fail me in my exams. So, teacher, your mother is doing okay. Even though the mother is dead. But how would that have made Peter a better person? How would that have improved him? Let me ask you, how many times in your relationship have you not told the truth because you wanted somebody to like you? You didn't want to create conflict. You thought, you know, let someone else tell them the truth. I don't want that problem. That is not Christ-like. That is not the example of Jesus. However, don't you never say however. however. Because I know some people are nodding like this. <laughs> yes, tell them the truth. If your truth is not communicated with love, it achieves nothing. Anybody can blot out the truth. Anybody can open their mouth and just blot out truth. But only a person who cares will make the effort, will go through the trouble to tell me the truth in a loving and respectful way. Only somebody who cares will bother to tell me the truth in a way that will help me, not in a way that will tear me down. And that person is worthy to be my friend. Anybody can tell me, my man, PF, your breath stinks. Anybody can tell me that. It doesn't take anything out of you, your breath stinks. But the person who cares about you will tell you your breath stinks in a way that will not destroy your self-esteem. Hallelujah. Because my friend is not supposed to destroy my self-esteem. But you know what? We're so lazy and so selfish. All we're worried about is that ah, this stinky breath. Just Let me just remove this discomfort from my life. That's all we're thinking about. We're not thinking about how it's going to affect the person. All we want is either stop talking or get away from me. So we don't blot it out. Ah, your breath stinks. And we crush this person. There are many ways to tell somebody they've got a problem without destroying them in the process. The truth may sting, but when you wrap it in love, it becomes acceptable, it becomes helpful. Amen? Love is what makes the truth 
a blessing. Without love, it becomes a weapon that people use to destroy one another. God did not intend for us to walk alone. He intended for us to make connections, to have deep and meaningful relationships. And a critical component of that is service. But not just any kind of service, but a service that comes with compassion, a service that speaks the truth. Amen? You see, the problem many of us have is that when we try to do this in our own strength, we find ourselves failing. We do it for a week and we're tired. It's too much energy. It is too time consuming. If you're Jesus, if you were Jesus, serving would come naturally to you. Compassion would come naturally to you. Telling the truth would come naturally to you. But since you are not Jesus, you need Jesus to help you. In Matthew 22, as I close, from verse 37, the Bible says, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is equally as important. Love your neighbor as yourself. It says all the other commandments and all the other demands of the prophets are based on these two. Listen, if you want better relationships, if you want deeper relationships, you must love God first. The deeper you go with God, the deeper you can go with others. When you love God first with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, then you are empowered by the grace of God to love other people as Jesus would have loved them. Relationships work best in the context of a relationship, of a deep relationship with God. So this morning, if you're here and you are concerned that you are alone, the question I want to ask you is this. To what extent are you connected with God? And if you are connected with God, then to what extent are you serving the people that God brings into your life? Or do you just want to take from people and not to give to people? Or do you, you know, I don't want to take and I don't want to give. Alas, there's only one of you. Let us bow our heads and pray. To what extent are you connected to God? How deep is your relationship with God? Your relationship with people is a reflection of your relationship with God. The deeper you are, the closer you are to God, the more connected you will find yourself to the people of God. Heavenly Father, we, we bless you and we give you praise. Almighty God, we, we just magnify your name. We commit each and every person that is here into your hands. We ask that, Father, you will turn the hearts of stone into hearts of flesh. You will draw us closer to you. You will draw us, Father, into a deep, meaningful relationship with you. Help us, Almighty God, that we may see even as you see. Give us eyes that see as you see, that your name may be glorified. We give you praise and we give you glory. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord.